So uh, the story tonight is about this company. It turns out Hopewell had a toy company, who knew? Um, well, we had some clues to it and some early articles about it, but we've finally been able to put the story together pretty well, though there are some gaps in it that I will complain about as we go along. Um, and these are the five toys. And as you can see, they're incredibly well-preserved for 100-year-old toys. <laughs> they're bright, they're vibrant, they're still structurally sound and all the rest of that. It's amazing. So let's talk about them. So I'll talk about um, the time period, the 20s. What were they doing making toys in this time period? I'll talk about the building where they made the toys. Oh, hi, Joe. And I'll talk about, um, well, the, the, the company itself and how it was formed and that kind of thing. And then we'll spend most of our time on the toys because that's the fun part. So um, just to mention coming in here, next slide. Um, just a little bit about the Hopewell Valley History Project. If you haven't been there, it's a website where we're basically collecting all the Hopewell history we can find digitizing it, photographing it, and just getting it online so it can be freely shared. That's the whole point of the site. So in the past three years, uh, we have information and materials from about 110 individual contributors at this point, over 500 documents and maps, including the key ones that you would want to start out with if you have questions, over 3,000 images and video, an interactive Hopewell history map. You click on an address in Hopewell and it pops up the photos and information. And so for this presentation, there's a lot more information online. So I'll post the slides online, we'll post the video online of where it joins previous talks. And then we have about 30 history briefs, research reports on Hopewell. Uh, local organizations like the library, local places, local businesses. So there's um, reports online with more information about the company and about the building as well. And so the uh, not so subtle subtext to this point is, um, please help us save local history. Stuff is being thrown out every day, dumpsters every day. And so if you have some interesting stuff photos, documents, artifacts, whatever. We want to know about it. If you know people who do, please get in touch with us and we will do whatever's necessary to preserve that stuff. We'll photograph it, we'll scan it. People ship me stuff in the mail. They ship stuff over the internet. They drop it off on the front porch. Um, I go and scan things. You get, you get digital copies of stuff back so you can share it with your extended family. And if you're done with it, I can also help be a channel to somewhere to deposit it, to archive it. So there's the museum and we also have the Historical Society and um, the library obviously here as well. So those are all places we can archive stuff. So enough of that, let's get started. So Hoprico. So just a quick summary, Hoprico stands for the Hopewell Products Company and it existed only from 1923 to 28. So a whole lot of fuss about a very short piece of time here tonight. It was founded in 1923 by the Pearson family. You'll meet them in a bit. They had a factory on Burton Avenue here in town. You'll find out more about that. And they had six known toys, plus some variants. And we have examples of all six of those toys here, which is just unbelievably cool and boxes for many of the toys here as well. So you can see them and you, can, you can't, but the exhibitor might be willing to pull the string and make it turn, you know, it's just really cool. So um, what are the toys? Well, you have a handout about the toys, but just to summarize for the people in Zoom, in the top right is the Buddy Sand Sled. It's a sled slash boat that you play in the sand with, what, duh, what else? And the bottom right is one of the twin flyers. So that's a dirigible with a big propeller in the back. And then that morphed into the toy in the middle bottom, which is the Hopewell twin flyer. So it has two of them that spin. 
Then there's also an indoor golf game. We have one of those here. And then finally, there's the easy go round carousel, which is a different spinning toy. So we'll talk about all of these tonight. And how do we know about these? Well, we know about them because we have examples of them. And these are still popular. They're still selling on eBay. One of the flyers just sold for 70 something dollars on eBay. Not bad for a product that was originally 25 cents, right? And a century later. And we have some ads. We have about 20 ads that we can find in newspapers across the country. So there are local papers in New York and Pennsylvania. Uh, Hope Rico had New York distributors, um, Ohio, Michigan, Illinois, um, South Washington, DC, North Carolina, and West Oregon and Hawaii. We have no idea if this is all of them or whether all of these dates are exclusive, but these are the ones we've been able to find. And you can see the pictures of the ads here. They're describing the toys for the inexpensive toys at the top the flyer and the uh, sand sled. And then the, the bottom, these are products that are list for a dollar and significantly discount at 69 cents and 59 cents. And you can see they have pictures and text for them as well. So next slide, uh, let's talk about the time. So the time is the twenties, what we now call the roaring twenties. So World War I was definitely in the rear view mirror and this was the age of modernness and art deco and jazz. It was the age of mass consumerism, mass manufacturing, mass advertising. Consumers were getting cars and telephones, electrical appliances. You don't have to beat your rug. You can actually vacuum it now. What a concept. Radio and films, et cetera. And at the same time, prohibition was going on. So the time was a little screwy when you think about it that way. And all that roaring went over. And then in 1929, it hit the wall with the Great Depression. So Hope Rico sold out in 1928, the year before the Depression started. So somebody had a good idea to sell the business at that time. So good for them. And then what was happening in the toy market? Uh, I can hear you, Bob. Uh, what happened in the toy market, a mass produced, beginnings of real mass produced toys, especially metal toys, lots of vehicles, people wanted cars and trucks and trains and boats and planes. Um, the popularity of construction sets like Tinker Toys and Linker Logs that are still with us today. Um, and the popularization of brand name toys. They've been out for a while and then this, in this mass consumer world, they were exploding. So we have a Raggedy Ann and Erector sets and Radio Flyer Wagon and all that kind of stuff. And then as a damper on all this, in 1927, polystyrene was invented. So here's a much better way, arguably, to make toys than making them out of tin. So if you were Hoprico, a metal toy making company, 1928 would be a really good year to sell out that business as well. So just looking at this, you see that 1928 makes a lot of sense for this company. Whether they knew this or not, they were smart. Um, we can see more about the time here. So um, these, I'll show you a couple display ads from newspapers. So this is June, 1925. Frederick Lozer and Company in Brooklyn uh, was promoting seashore products. And so you look at these ads and you can see beach balls for 25 cents, shovels and pails for a dollar or two, outdoor games, sand boats, that kind of thing. And then down at the bottom is Buddy Sand Sleds, the Hopico toy for 25 cents. So they were undercutting the competition. They were, they were going low ball with these products. And the other thing you see here is apparently I lied on the last show about the last slide about branding because you don't see branding here. You don't see Mattel or Hasbro. You don't see strong brands at all. You see Buddy Sand Sled and Seahawk Sand Boats, but nothing in the way of real strong branding on this page at all. So, Here's another example. 
So we're now in December 1927, and we're looking at Christmas toys and other Christmas products from Benetch and Sons in Pottsville, PA. And there's a huge, weird collection of things here. Dolls at a dollar, pedal toys for $2 or $5, and furniture for $169. So maybe this, this is the discounts they're pushing or something, I don't know. But in the bottom right, outlined here is the Hopewell Flyer, a $1 list price toy for sale at 59 cents. And that's a deal because the individual flyers themselves list for 25 cents. So that's, that's good news for the buyer, right? In the bottom left, you'll also see a carousel, but it's not the Hopewell Cooks carousel. You can tell because the flag's wrong. And you can also tell because the horses have tails and they don't have tails in the Hope Go Park. So there, now you know. Okay. So that's the time. Here's the place. And just briefly to root us in space and lead to the next slide. So in Hopewell, there's a train station and a train tracks. And right across the train tracks is Front Street, which runs parallel to the tracks. And then coming off that to the left here is Burton Avenue. And one reason it's called Burton Avenue is because J.G. Burton had the house there at the corner. And we'll come back to him in a second. And he's the one who actually built the building that Hoprico ran their factory out of. And you see that on the left there. In this map from 1927, it's labeled Hope Hopewell Products Company. And then across Burton Avenue, across the street, is the current home of the borough Department of Public Works, which is where the borough was pumping water. So that will come back in just a second. Next slide. Thank you. You're way out in front here. Uh, so Burton. So Burton built that building that you see in the bottom right here in 1880, uh, 1897. And it's variously described as a stair building business or a sash and blind business. Basically he did mill work. So he did sashes and blinds and windows and doors and um, stairways in general and all of that kind of stuff. But he focused on first sashes and blinds and then stair builders you can see in the bottom left. So there are Burton stairs around Hopewell because of that. And he was also a general contractor and a general builder. He uh, won contracts to help develop uh, certain developments in the area as well. Then he discovered um, his, an artesian well on his property and he decided to go into the water business. So he invented this product, Artois table water, um, which he began selling around 1909. But unfortunately, as you saw across the street was the borough department of public works and they started drilling wells there and they diverted his water supply. And he was not happy about that as you may have guessed. And so he sued the borough. And so there's a lot of discussion in the newspaper about this, but unfortunately in 1916, during that process, he collapsed in court and then later died, okay. Now he didn't have a partner, so there was nobody to continue operating his businesses. So what often happens in this kind of case is that the family just sells everything. So there's a public sale of the property, the business, the house, all of the equipment that was in the building, all sold, and then the family decamped to Trenton. So, the building was pretty much cleared out at that point, unfortunately. So that's the stair factory. So what else happened in that building? Again, for some more context. So uh, Hoprico was there, as we said, 1923 to 28. They bought the property. Then they sold out in 1928 to the two Dinger brothers who ran the Hopewell Manufacturing Company there. According to later newspaper articles, they continued selling toys, apparently, but we can't, we don't have any evidence of that, which is frustrating. And they were very busy. They had up to 40 people working three shifts during that time. And then they ran into the depression 
And so they totally refocused their business as an ornamental iron business, so porch railings and things like that. And, excuse me, let me do that. And um, they continued there till 1945 when they moved to Trenton and continued their business there. Then from 1946 on, it was the home or the business of Albert Benson who ran a machine shop there but he also ran, uh, focused on upholstering and awning. So the middle clipping here on the right is the Benson business, B and K. And he actually got a United States patent mm -hmm. for a modification to an awning to put a window in it. Yeah, roof lights. One right. of the very few patents that came out of Hopewell in, the, well, in yeah. those early years. The big door. Um, after he died, the McDowells were there, 1969 to 73. Um, they had a gift shop in Princeton called the Country Mouse and the neighbors, the nice. current neighbors tell us that they basically use this building as a warehouse for their business. And then in 1973, Ken and Connie McIndoe bought the house, converted it to a residence and also their art studios. They've been there ever since and they're here tonight. Thank you very much over there somewhere. And uh, at their building, as you can see in the bottom right there is very much the same building. Unfortunately, all the good stuff that used to be in that building was gone by the time they arrived. So there's not much Hope or Co. There was not much of anything else there. It was just pretty much all gone. Oh, well, right? So at this point, let's talk about the company. So the company, Hope or Co., we have information from the newspaper about how the company was formed and who was involved. It was formed in 1923. The stated purpose was to manufacture toys and novelties of wood and metal. And it was capitalized to the tune of $100,000, which was a lot of money at the time. Thank you very much. And uh, the main people involved were the Pearsons. So Dr. Pearson and his son, Theodore Jr. And you can see their pictures at the bottom right there, a very young picture of Dr. Pearson and then his son when he was at MIT. So Dr. Pearson was uh, the chairman of the board of the company and provided much of the initial funding. He was a Hopewell fixture. He was a uh, physician in Hopewell for over 50 years. He was um, greatly loved in the area. He was elected mayor four different times. He was involved in business. He was one of the organizers of the Hopewell Chocolate Company, in the chocolate factory down on Railroad Avenue. He was a director of the Hopewell National Bank and he was involved in the community. He was one of the organizers of the fire department as well. So a busy, busy guy. And um, two of the buildings in town, uh, Blackwell down by Lafayette and then the Italianate Tower building at Broad and Blackwell were his buildings as well, his homes as well. So the family lore says that he started this company to attract his son back to Hopewell because his son had decamped to Detroit to be in the auto business. So Theodore Jr. Uh, was in mechanical engineering. He got a degree at Drexel and then he went to MIT and got his second degree there. But his resume says he has degrees from both MIT and Harvard, which doesn't make any sense and which doesn't fit a timeline to put both of those schools in. And the reason it turns out is for a brief moment in time, MIT and Harvard decided to consolidate their engineering schools. And so for the period of time that Theodore Pearson was there, they, they granted two degrees. So he went to MIT and got a bonus Harvard degree on the way out the door. Pretty good deal, pretty good deal. And it's on his resume ever since. So it's just sort of cool. So he was involved in the auto industry in Trenton and then with Chevrolet in Detroit. He did come back to Hope Welder on Hope Rico. Then he went back to Detroit to the Hudson Motor Company. And then he finished back in this area, the end of his career last 25 years with Homosote Corporation, uh, where he was VP of production. So we know all this about the startup of the company. And then we know almost nothing about what happened afterwards, unfortunately, but we're, we're gonna work on it. Okay, so what do we know about the Hopico products? 
Well, we have some newspaper ads and we have some of the toy products, but what came before that? There were two years before that, that we don't have anything. And we have two things, two tiny hints of what was going on. So in the top right here is one ad for Paul Cutter's drugstore, which is the same building that's the pharmacy in Hopewell today, just down at the corner, right next door here. And it says they're selling Hoprico necklaces and earrings to match all the latest shades. So this company that's ramping up to sell impressive looking toys was also making tiny little jewelry score, you know, jewelry for pharmacies or something. We have no idea. There's no evidence of this anywhere else in any paper in the United States of America for this entire period. So we just have that. And then the other one is, is even odder in some ways. So as I said at the beginning, the point of the history project is to just suck up material, get it digitized, get it online. And when you do that, you get hits that you don't expect. And the hit here is a program for the Hopewell High School senior play in December 1924, just two pieces of paper with the program and some display ads. And in there is this ad, and it says Hoprico silencers for closed car doors available at any garage manufactured by Hopewell Products Company. That's definitely our company, and they're selling silencers. So what's a silencer, right? Well, the, the idea is the doors rattle when you drive, so you want them to be quieter, and maybe when you slam the door, it's noisy, you want it to be quieter. So we're talking little pieces of rubber. So you could buy silencers in this time frame for two cents for a little tiny piece of rubber, and they came on sheets. So this company, which is going to be making all these great toys, was apparently making jewelry and little pieces of rubber, which you know just doesn't make any sense at all, but it's what they're doing. And just to rub that in, there is a reference. There are several reference books that list um, New Jersey companies and New Jersey engineering companies and that kind of thing. So we can find the company listed in them. And in 1928, there's a listing in the Engineers of Corporations of New Jersey's book that says they make sand sleds and door silencers. So maybe 20 cent little pieces of rubber was a profitable line for them. We have no idea. You know, we have no other evidence of this. They're just toying with us at this point. Um, so that's all I can say about all of that. So we're on to toys, okay? And the, what we know about the toys comes from looking at them, comes from some of the, looking at the boxes and looking at um, the other materials that came along with them and also some of the newspaper ads. I said we have about 20 newspaper ads, but it's hard to find these because they're not strongly branded. And it's hard to do a global search of every newspaper in the United States and find these things. So here's the toys. So I'm going to go through them in rough order of mechanical complexity, which probably is associated with the order in which they were invented and introduced in the market, maybe, which sort of matches the order they show up in the newspapers. And some of them have a numbering scheme, so it matches that numbering scheme as well. So this is all guesswork, of course. Um, the, so going left to right on the screen here, the first is the indoor golf board game. It's just five spinners on a board. You can see one over here. Um, the second one is the buddy sand sled, which is a, a little boat slash sled, sled to play in the sand. Um, and then the third is the Hopewell Flyer, the individual dirigible that you wind up and it flies. Those two toys were 25 cents. So the little folded metal sled was the same price as the mechanical flyer toy, which is sort of fascinating. And then the last two products were the more complex products and sold for a dollar. That's a big jump up on the pay scale, right? So the Hopewell Twin Flyer took two of those flyers and put them on a pedestal so they could fly around. And then the last one is the easy go round, the merry go round carousel toy, also for a dollar. So I'm going to talk about each of these toys 
first of all, this sort of general product concept, what the idea of the toy was, then look at it from a retail point of view. So what do the boxes tell us? And we also have some retail product sheets, which you can see as well. And that tells us more. And then we'll look at it from a design perspective. How is it designed to be used? Uh, what, about, what about the artwork they put on it? What were the messages they were sending? And then the mechanical design as well. So here's the fun part, let's begin. So the first to toy is the indoor golf boy board game. And you just look at the colors on this. There's one over here, it's hundred years later, it's still bright and vibrant, it's amazing. So it's a simple golf game where you can learn to play golf indoors, isn't that exciting? And it has five spinners and one composite hole design that you play over and over again to move around the course, okay? So how is it actually built as a product? It's a tin board with the printed scene on it. There's a heavy wooden frame around it, which, which gives it a lot of solidness. But the one composite hole is designed to be played 18 times from different distances. So you invent different holes along the way and the spinners represent different clubs and show you the result you spin and you see how far you hit the ball and whether you hit a hazard or something like that. And so in the bottom left is the center of the box. The box is tartan, of course, this is golf, right? And uh, you can see the beautiful, beautiful um, drawing. So this is the club room at the golf club and they're playing the indoor golf club while the moose on the wall watches under the fire. And then out the window is a uh, golf game in progress, right? Of course. And the game comes with uh, scorecards and other kinds of things and playing pieces. And we actually have some of the playing pieces here in the bottom right. Um, just really cool. And then there's toying with us looking at this back a hundred years. There's a reference in the instructions that say, if you're playing tournaments and you want to give prizes, you can send us 250, sorry, $2.50, and we will send you a miniature gold lined, silver plated loving cup, which is three inches high. Wouldn't that be cool to find? <laughs> oh my gosh, that would be cool to find, but oh well. So that's lost, unfortunately. And then from a design perspective, here's the spinners, a close up on the spinners. You can also see they put abbreviated instructions on the board itself. So you don't have to read the instructions every time to refresh yourself. There's a course card that tells you the distance and the par for each of the virtual courses on this play. And there's also some other artwork on the, on the board as well, just very nicely done. And then here's the instructions. And you look at the level of effort they put in to design this game. So there's a whole page of how to play the game and, and the penalties. And then there's another whole page of helpful information. So here's the terms of golf. Here's examples of how you score in golf. And at the end, there's advice for having parties and tournaments and things like that. They really thought this out. So, I mean, you look at this from the design perspective, a hundred years later, you look at it um, from the art perspective and you look at it from the way they put this game together. It's just really fascinating. Okay, so that's number one. Number two is the Buddy Sand Sled. Now you notice I didn't name prices for the golf game. We have no external evidence about the golf game at all. Unfortunately, we don't have any paperwork and we don't have any pricing information. And if you search indoor golf in every newspaper in the United States of America, you get a lot of hits, none of which help you any. So I got nothing, unfortunately. Excuse me, I have to clear the screen. There we go. Um, so this is the Buddy Sand Sled. So this is a beach toy. And it's just a metal sled designed to be used on the beach, as you may have guessed. So you can drag it on its string or you can float it in the water. What else would a kid need? And it's about uh, 12 by four inches and it's 25 cents, list 25 cents. So the quote on it is, carries water and sand and floats. What more could you ask for, right? It floats. Um, so it's, it's described as a beach toy for small tots. 
Um, it has no sharp corners. I'm not injuring myself as I touch it. And it um, comes in different versions. So this, as you can see, looks different from the picture here. And we have multiple of these different versions on display here tonight, which I'll show you as well. It also comes with a shovel and a tow line. In other words, a string. Ooh, tow line, right? And one of these over here has a shovel and a tow line. And with luck, is the original product, which would be just amazing. And so we have evidence in the market in the newspapers by 1925 for this. So this is presumably an early product which makes sense, right? So also on display, we have a product sheet. So we have these retailer product sheets for all but the golf game products. And it's described as the ideal toy for small tots on the beach, at the sand pile, or in the house. I don't know about bringing the sand into the house, but that's a separate issue. And on the right here, we have um, parts of the box. And we have some boxes over here as well. And you can see the graphical design on it, carries water and sand and floats. What more could you ask for? And this box has the name of a distributor. So they were using Products Corporation of America as their only distributor for this product, which then showed up in stores around the country. So how that worked, we don't know, okay. And then from a design point of view, we have four different versions of this product. So the first two did not have the artwork on them. They just have the name of the product on them. And we have examples of these in green and yellow. So you can see these. Same design, just different artwork. And then two more lithographs with drawings. The top one is this one I've been waving around. So it's a line drawing in yellow. And then the bottom one is full color. And you can see the really nice artwork here. So first of all, the artwork shows kids playing with the toy. Duh, what else would you show, right? So the, the thing is, is reminds you every time you look at it, what you're supposed to do with it, right? You're supposed to take kids out and they shovel sand into it and they drag it and they they're holding their spade and they're happy right and then the artwork also includes a beach umbrella and the water in the background and boats on the water and all the rest of that so just really nice job of designing this and then if we look at the ends on the left here what did they do on the end it's a drawing of a kid writing the name of the product in the sand. What more could you ask for, right? That's right. So kids, buy the toy, then go down to the beach and write the name all over the beach. Right? That'll be great. <clears throat> and then the, um, the, the bottom one on this stack of boats just has the product label on it in the back. So then the right photo here shows the logo and the trademark. So it's a football, if I dare say so, the Circle Hopico trademark, made in Hopewell, New Jersey, USA, in case you were confused, and patent applied for. So these products variously say patent applied for or patent pending, and uh, several of the products have the Hopewell trademark on it, the Hopewell Hopro Co trademark on them. And unfortunately, there's no evidence from the United States Patent and Trademark Search of anything related to Hope Rico, anything at all. Sorry. And that Artois uh, table water was supposedly trademarked. There's no evidence of that either. And trademarking was a thing at the time. So what exactly went on here? I don't know. It would have been really nice to be able to find something like that. <clears throat> there were several patents in Hopewell at the time. So it's, it's not like it didn't happen at all. So I mentioned the, uh, the awning patent, for example, there was a car injector patent. There was an egg candler patent, but just a handful of them. And none of these, unfortunately. <clears throat> so that's product number two. So now we get to the Hopewell flyer. So the Hopewell flyer is a dirigible. It's about nine inches long. You wind it up and the propeller spins, okay? 
and it flies in a six foot circle. So here's the concept. It comes with an eight foot thread. You hang it from the ceiling in your empty house, <laughs> and then you wind it up and it flies rapidly in a six foot circle, whacking the heads of your kids <laughs> as they run in fear for, I don't understand at all. Okay. I get most of these product concepts. This one, I do not get. I don't get it all. You know, it's it's not a good kid's toy. It's, you know, it'll poke your eyes out, right? <laughs> so what can I say? Um, but it's a clever design and we can talk about that. And the um, mechanism is actually in the gondola part. So they were able to separate the me mechanism and enclose it. So that was very clever. And we have ads for this from 1926 to 28. So pretty much simultaneously with the sand sled. So very interesting. The other thing you'll notice about these products, let me go back and talk about this a little more, is how they're made. So how do you make a tin toy? Well, one thing you do is you cut out pieces of tin and solder them together, but that stinks. This is all folded, okay? So you can see the end of the product there in the picture. This is folded over metal. So there's no sharp edges because they're folded over. And there's no seams because they're folded over. Just really, really intelligently done and still holding together. I'm waving a century old toy, it's sort of scary. And then you see the same thing with the flyer. There's a crimp around the edges of it. We do have at least one disassembled flyer over there so you can see the inside mechanism and you can see how they're made as well. So uh, here's the retail version of the plot flyer. So the product sheet on the left, a well-made high-grade toy attractively decorated in red, gray, and blue compares favorably with higher priced items. We're the low ball here, right? Okay. So they're making this thing for the lowest possible price, quite clearly what they're going on here. Again, sold through a distributor, a different distributor in New York City, but that distributor name is not on the box, it's on the retail sheet, which is interesting. And on the right is the box front. So they've managed to illustrate flying in a six foot circle on a box cover, which is really smart. And the hanging from a string thing, you see the string goes up and attaches to the product name at the top, which is really clever how they did these. I still don't understand it, but it's clever, right? So more about the design. So the mechanism itself is in the gondola, as I mentioned, and you just wind it up with the key. The key does not come out, so you can't lose it. That's very smart. And then the decoration on it is nice as well. So if you look in the top right, there's the product name Hopewell Flyer in red. There's a red blue star behind it. There's a red starburst on the front of the product and then red fins on the back. So just enough to make it interesting looking and balancing the red of the gondola underneath. And then the, on the back, they use the fins to add their logo material. And then you have that interestingly twisted fins on, on the back as well. And then we, thanks to the ripped apart toy, we can look at it in more detail. So here's the motor from the bottom. So you wind it up and it's just turning one gear. And then you can see at the bottom, the gear interfaces with a spring thread on the shaft. So the gear has tiny little teeth, which then cause the shaft to spin. So it's a nice mechanical design. It's rugged, presumably, and just makes that thing fly in circles. What can I say? It's wonderful. Um, so then the second product is the Hopewell Twin Flyer. So maybe flying six foot circles didn't make so much sense. So let's root it down on the ground. So we'll take two of these products, put it on a spinning base and call it a dollar product. So that makes sense too. And we actually have, thanks to the Macintosh, which I finally found on the floor there, uh, one of those tubes, actually several of those tubes that they did find in the factory building. All that's left of Oprico in the factory building is a couple of these yellow tubes. 
but we have a couple. So that's just really, really cool. And come back to this again a little bit later. So the idea is you're spinning a pair of these dirigibles. These are not the wind up dirigibles. And if you look, you can see right through the gondola. There's no motor in the gondolas at all. So these are coming up for sale on eBay. If it has a motor, it's the original twin flyer. If it doesn't have a motor, but it's being sold separately, it's from the, the twin flyer. And it's the, the description is rather grandiose. Two giant airships circling a mooring mast. Yeah, okay. But um, you pull the cord and it spins. What more can you ask for? So it's a, it's a better kid a toy for smaller kids to play with because of that. And at least one of these can be spun here on the floor tonight. So let's look at the design of that as well. So on the left is the product shape, big oversized number and value, brightly lithographed, rigid metal construction. So they're no longer talking about low price, they're talking about value, you see that? And on the right is the product box with the, the simple design on it. Now, the other thing to notice here is both of these sheets say number 24. What does that mean? Does that mean they sold 23 other products before this? Does it mean they designed 23 products and only sold two of them? Or does it mean they're just trying to piss us off? I, I don't know. I don't know. This is very, very frustrating. So the earlier product is actually 22, this is 24, and you'll see a 30 coming up. So it would be nice to know more about this and we just don't know. Sorry. Uh, okay, so look at the design of this product. So this does come in pieces and you assemble it. So you can see how easy it is to assemble. The, the dirigibles just hang from the cross arm and just slide right on there and the legs slip into the base and the instructions on the bottom right tell you what I just tell. Right? And then the winding mechanism is self retracting. So you pull the cord gently, kids, pull it gently and the thing spins for a while and then the cord retracts in as it's spinning and it's ready to go. So again, they try to make it as foolproof as possible. So that's the twin flyer. So the last spinning product is the carousel. So once they had this tube that spins, that tube that spins, right? They said, heck, we can wrap a carousel around it. So that's exactly what they did here. So this is about eight inches in diameter. It's also a dollar toy. And um, it's described as six brightly colored horses and riders in carnival colors. So you can see there's a lot more attention to color on this. And uh, it has a Hopewell pendant that goes on the top, which is really sort of neat. You don't expect toys to say Hopewell on them very much. And it's the same tube in the center that you pull the spin. Okay. So the cool thing we discovered tonight is one of the flyer so over here doesn't have the yellow tube it has this multicolor tube. So it looks like they ran out of yellow. We're still making both products, had switched over to the multicolor tube and just started using it for the other product as well. But we don't know, it's sort of frustrating. This we don't have evidence of till 1928. So it may have been a much later product, but we don't know. So here's the retail version of this product. So on the left is the retailer sheet as well. Big oversized number and value, sound familiar? Made of light gauge sheet iron, gaily lithographed with the metal pendant. That's a big bonus apparently. And, and on the right, we have the sides of the boxes and you can see them on display here as well. So look at the box design in the top right here. So the design shows two kids playing ball over the Hoprico logo on the right. And in the background are their other toys. So you can see the green flyer hanging there. You can see the red boat sitting there. 
And you can see a couple of the easy go rounds there in the background as well. And on the right side of the box, they show the toy, but in the context of being at a fair with people walking around, just making it feel more real. And then the top is just big vibrant colors as well. So this is really fun what they've done. Also, they call this product 33. Thanks a lot. <laughs> what does that mean? We don't know. Maybe there's some, you know, toy catalogs out there or special catalogs that talk about these products, but at this point we just don't know. Okay. So from a design point of view, the coolest thing about this product is the way they put the horses on. So normally you have a base, you drill holes in it, you stick the horses in. They just cut out the shape and folded it up. Okay folded it up. So they're mechanical design people. They're building the equipment to build these things. So they had a factory line where they took metal and they cut it and they colored it and they folded it. And then they cut out pieces like this and folded it up in ways that were clean and safe and didn't have sharp edges. I don't know how they did that. And it's just really, really impressive. When, when you look at these toys, it's just really fun what they did. So that's all the toys. And then here's the summary. So what do we know? We know about six toys and maybe there's some more, we don't know. We do have product literature in boxes. You can see them here. And there's photos uh, provided by these many contributors up on the website as well. So you can look at these in more detail. We have about 20 newspaper ads that sort of give us dates and pricing and the, dis the regional distribution of these products, but it's not in any way definitive or final. Um, we have a bunch of information about the company and its formation, but then nothing till the Dinger brothers bought it. And then some information from the Dinger brothers of what was going on when they took it over. And other than that, nobody was writing about it, unfortunately. There are the books I mentioned. There's some corporate listings, so we can see the company existed and who the officers were, and we knew all that already. Uh, we have some family history information. So it was formed to get Junior to come to Hopewell, and it was sold because it wasn't the right size for the market, we think. That's come down in, in family lore. And we do know about the factory building, quite a bit about the factory building from deeds and from articles about the different companies that were in there. So, so it's not like we don't know anything, <laughs> okay. But there's a whole bunch of stuff we don't have. We don't know what happened in those first early years. Um, lucking into a high school play program is you know, not what you wanna be relying on to research history, right? And uh, little rubber pieces. So that's all we got. The trademarks and patents was a total strikeout, unfortunately. So maybe companies were marking products with anticipation of things they would eventually do. I don't know. And then there's the whole number 33 thing, which is just unbelievably irritating. So I guess they designed 33 products and shipped six or so of them. I don't know or they just made up numbers, I don't know. I mean, the, the numbers are match what we would think the, the order the products came out in. So at least that part makes sense. They aren't just totally random, but that's all we got, unfortunately. So I would like to thank a whole bunch of people who provided information and materials to let us figure this all out. So there's the Hopewell Museum and the Hopewell Valley Historical Society, of course, they're exhibiting over on the table in the corner there and um, pointed me to a, a bunch of interesting material. There's the Pearson family who provided family lore and some, uh, some other products as well. The neighbors, the McIndoes and Lois Greaves who told us what was happening in that building afterwards. And then the collectors here tonight, Larry and Cindy Kayanka, Mary Ambin, Devlin and Mary Briggs, Kayanka Briggs, Devlin, in that order over there. And then uh, David McCandless and Craig Thompson are other collectors who provided information as well. So I'd really like to thank them. We have photos 
um, provided by the, all of these people up on the website. So you can see different versions of the products or different angles of the products as a result of that. And also Tom McCandless was an early collector of these back in 1996. He wrote an article that uh, the Kainikas have uh, some copies of they can show you. That was the first attempt to write down what the heck was going on with these toys at the time. So that's the story. Thank you all very much. And we will do questions now. And then after the questions, there will be time to wander around in the building here as well. So Zoom people, you're welcome to ask questions, type them in and, and we'll relay them up to the stage. And otherwise, thank you much. Thank you for coming. So questions? I can sort of see here. Oh, yes. Joe, go. I have three things. One, um, you know, here's a senior, one, the founder of the Purple Dot. Yes. It's not surprising at all. Oh, oh. Fred. Yes. Yes, okay. Secondly, you know, here's a senior, it's not a senior, but it's a call buddy. Yes. And I wondered if Buddy, the Buddy's not the main that's that's the assumption yeah yes yes so let me let me repeat those and we'll get to number three yes we'll get to number three so number one dr pearson was one of the founders of the hopewell valley golf club and therefore it's not surprising there's a golf game here which i just never made that connection so thank you and then number two is pearson jr's son was known as buddy so when they talk about the family in the newspaper, it's the daughter and buddy. So one assumes the sled was named for him. Unfortunately, a brand name that was exploding at the time was Buddy T that made these kinds of products as well, including sand products. So if you search for Buddy Sand in every newspaper in the United States, it's a useless search, unfortunately. And number three. Number three is great marks at that time, I believe, right? State level, we have state archive. So, yeah, yeah, it's just so frustrating. Yeah. So maybe. Yeah, yeah. I'm building a list of things I want to research. Artois is another one that should be trademarked. So thank you. Yeah, trademarks. Un unlike patents, were uh, state based for a period. Before I don't know. I, I don't know when that yeah, changed. I don't know when that changed. Yeah, you had to Yeah. Yeah, the Congress Congress had a battle with the Supreme Court about how to do that. And so that, that was frustrating. Okay, thank you. Other other questions, comments? Yes. So the the uh, the Digger brothers took over the fish. Yes. Did they retain the the, the trademark or did they rename yeah, so the Dinger brothers took over, bought the business, Lock, Stock, and Barrel. And then according to what they said later, they continued to sell what sounds like the same toys. We have no evidence of that. We have no evidence of those names. And um, collectors have not found post this time period these kinds of toys. So we just don't know. And that was apparently a brief period because then the Dingers ran into the depression and changed their business totally. So yeah, I mean, possibly these toys were made after Hopico by the Dingers, but they kept the names, but they weren't using the Hopewell Products Company name. They were using the Hopewell Manufacturing Company name, which also doesn't show up anywhere either. It's very frustrating. So yeah, we don't know. Hi. Their company. It actually said Burton and Mailer. Yes. But then you said Burton didn't have anyone to be company. So what happened with Mailer? Yeah, I, I didn't go into that. Okay. It's, it's in the write up, but Burton had numerous partners in the early part of his business and then eventually didn't have any partners anymore. So by the end, he was partnerless. <laughs> but yeah, Mailer was the name most associated with him. But yeah, I ducked that issue. So yeah. Anything on line, Bob? No, okay. 
Uh, last call for online questions. Last call for live questions. Going, going, go on. Okay, thank you very much. Appreciate it.